Well, good morning. It's good to have you with us again. I know that this is a unique way for us to meet together, but it's fulfilling a purpose right now during the quarantine with this uh, COVID-19 virus that's spreading and literally taking thousands of lives around the world. We're going to be getting studying today or continue studying today the book of Mark chapter 4 verses 13 to 20. But before we get started, let's take just a moment to go to God in prayer. Would you pray with me? Dear God, we are gathered in this unique way today in order that we might study your word so that learning and growing and developing might take place in the hearts and lives of each and every one of us. Help us to learn from the truths of your word this day. Let your spirit fill us and open our hearts. Prepare the soil of our hearts, dear Lord, in order that your word might penetrate and grow. Dear Lord, I ask that you will use me as your vessel. Help me to be faithful to not only sharing your word, but delivering it. For it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Before we get started this morning, <clears throat> we really need to take just a few moments uh, to review some of the things that we learned last week. Last week, we learned that the seed in the parable represents the Word of God. We learned that the sower who was sowing the seed, well, that could be anyone who was sharing the good news of the gospel with others. We learned that we'd only have a harvest. We would get that. We would only have a harvest if the seeds are planted. Thus, the farmer would sow the seeds everywhere in anticipation of a great harvest. Once Jesus finished teaching, the crowds began to disperse. And this left Jesus with a few of his closest disciples there next to him. And they were a little perplexed by the meaning of the parable that he had just sown to the multitudes. So they asked Jesus, Hey, could you just explain this for us? I'm not sure we've got, I'm not sure we got the point. Well, this is where we pick up the story today. Let's begin reading in Mark chapter 4, verse number 13. This is what that verse says. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? <laughs> Jesus is going to explain the parable to them, don't worry. But before he does, he wants them to know that they've got some growing to do. Jesus says, note and paraphrase, if your cognitive ability lets this slip through its grasp, <laughs> then you're in for a heap of hurt when I share some of these deeper parables with you. In essence, if you can't get this one, then you're flat out of luck when it comes to understanding some of the other parables I'm going to share. Now, this was especially true of the hard-hearted religious rulers. Jesus is reaching his limit with these two-faced religious folks. The bottom line is, he's been sowing his word to the Lord their hearts, and the devil's been picking it from their hearts again and again and again. They are unwilling to allow the hearts to be softened in order that it can penetrate, and Jesus is letting them have it with this parable. The farmer, it says in verse number 14, the farmer sows the word. Now, we learned from last week that what seemed to be reckless abandon on the part of the farmer who was sowing the seeds, broadcasting them everywhere, was really an expression of unmatched love. He wanted to give absolutely every seed a chance to, to land on the soil and grow. He was giving the seed of God's word an opportunity to bear fruit. The word of God, it always has the power to produce fruit, but to do so. It requires a receptive heart, receptive soil, if you will. Now, Jesus has got their attention. He's kind of hit them up the side of the head with these words, that, and they're listening. He continues to teach his disciples. This verse affirms our interpretation from last week because Jesus himself says, the sower sows the word. He just lays it out there. He's going to keep going and explain what that means in Mark chapter 4, verse number 15. Some people are like seed along the path where the word sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Those birds that are coming down, they represent Satan himself trying to pick up the word of God and rip it from the hearts of people before it can take root and make a difference. Jesus is turning his attention away from the sower and toward the soil, away from the seed and toward the hardened hearts of men. He's directing them to the main point of this parable. His attention 
Well, let's get into the various soil types that the word may very well land on. The first type of soil would have been in view of all the people in Palestine on a daily basis. As they travel to work, as they travel to school or to the store or just out for a visit, they would have seen this soil. They would have walked on this soil. It was the impacted soil of the paths that were the major thoroughfares of their community. While the Romans built some amazing roads between cities, most of the local traffic was relegated to dirt paths. Jesus is directing their attention to these paths. And he says, those paths out there that you walk on, that you pack down, some of the seed that the farmer's broadcasting out there is going to land on those paths because the, they go right up to the edge of the field. When they do, those seeds are going to meet their doom. He said the birds are going to come in and they're going to devour that grain. He puts a face on the reality of his story when he tells them when the word of God falls on hard, impacted hearts, the devil comes in and scoops it up so that it has no chance of even taking root, more or less bearing a crop. For as many of the religious rulers had hearts exactly like this. They've been hearing, but not perceiving. They witnessed Jesus' words and works firsthand. But rather than accepting them as coming from God, they attributed the words and works of Jesus to Satan himself. They refused to allow Jesus' words and works to penetrate and change their hearts. What a sad commentary on the religious rulers. We've got to make sure as leaders in Christ Church that's not happening to us. It's not enough for us to come and share words with other people. It's not enough for us to share things that are true about God with other people. We've got to allow the truths of God to penetrate our hearts and make a difference in our lives. Well, that brings us to Mark chapter 4, verse number 16. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and once receive it with joy. Jesus tells them that this rocky ground represents people who hear the word and at once receive it with joy. For the first few weeks, they're at church every time the doors are open. They are beaming with joy, smiling from ear to ear, wanting to hug everybody, shake everybody's hand. They feel fresh and clean and forgiven. They've come into contact with the blood of Jesus and has gotten rid of the guilt and the power and the punishment of sin in their lives. They know it and they appreciate it. But as time goes by, their family and their friends begin to see that they've changed. They begin to poke at them and pick at them because of the changes inside of their life. Where they used to go out and get drunk, they don't go out and get drunk anymore. Where they used to uh, have blue mist coming from their mouth as they spoke from all the bad words, they were no longer saying those words. The family noticed the change. And they give these folks some pretty negative attention. What's going on with you? What are you, a Holy Joe now? What happened to you? Do you get Jesus? Well, they start to feel a little uncomfortable with their family and their friends and their input. So they put on the brakes. They stop coming to church. And they wither up. And they die. And that brings us to Mark chapter 4, verse 17. But since they have no root... They last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. They start missing worship services. They refuse to get involved with other believers. They stop learning, growing, and developing into the children that God's called them to be. They've got no root, and they endure only for a short while. When they find themselves being belittled, mocked, persecuted, made fun of, they bail. They wanted to rake in all the benefits of the kingdom, but they don't want the discomfort of living for Jesus. Friends, you can't allow the voices of others to deter you from being who God's called you to be. These folks, they simply turn their back on the words and works of Jesus. This happens all the time. People come to Jesus, they're baptized into Christ, they experience freedom from the guilt, power, and punishment of sin, but they're not about to join a small group. They're not about to attend Sunday school. They're not about to have daily devotions. They're not about to defend their faith. They're not about to confess Jesus before their family and their friends. These folks are fair-weather believers. When things get tough, these folks fly the coop. 
They're like pigs that return to the wallow once they've been washed. They're like a dog that goes and licks up its own vomit after it's puked on the ground. They refuse to bear kingdom fruit and go back to their old way of life. Let's read Mark chapter 4. I'm going to read a couple of verses this time, 18 and 19, because of the way they go together. Still others, like seeds sown among the thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Did you get that? Some folks are genuinely drawn to Jesus. They really do want to have a relationship with him. But these nasty thorns, they get in the way. My mind's immediately drawn to the rich young ruler and Judas Iscariot. The rich young ruler had great wealth and he wanted to keep it. So when Jesus told him to get rid of it and follow him, he turned his back on Jesus. Judas wanted to obtain great wealth and was willing to turn his back on Jesus to get it. Money, power, prestige, possessions, they can all draw us away from our Savior. When we allow things to become our focus, we end up turning our back on the only wealth that truly matters. These worldly temptations are represented by the thorns. They act upon us just like the thorns act upon fragile plants. They choke the eternal life right out of us. We give up what's best to hang on to something we've come to view as good and desirable on this earth. The last verse that we're going to read this morning is found in Mark chapter 4, verse 20. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, heal the word, accept it, and produce a crop 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. The good soil. The good soil represents hearts that openly accept the word of God. They allow the word of God to penetrate their hearts and change their lives. They allow the word of God to mold them. They allow the word of God to direct them. When the word of God is allowed to penetrate the hearts and the minds and the lives of men, it bears fruit. The amount of the harvest, well, now that may vary. Some will be 30-fold, some 60, some 100-fold. But you can count on the fact that the seed's good. When given the proper soil, the proper heart, it'll produce an abundant harvest. Friends, God's commanded us to go into all the world with his message of hope and love. We've been given an amazing mission to preach to all of humanity. God's message of hope will inevitably land on different types of soil, hearts. Some will take root in the hearts they land on and some will not. But the only way the only way we can ever hope to have a successful harvest is if we get out there and plant the seed. That's exactly what Jesus has called us to do. We are to sow the seed. Amazingly enough, we're not told to try and change the soil. The soil's been prepared by the Holy Spirit, working on the life of the individual whose heart is represented by the soil. Jesus let the rich young ruler walk away. Jesus let Jesus, Judas betray him with a kiss. Jesus let the religious ruler's hearts continue to be hard. He knew that some would reject his message of hope no matter how much love it represented. And the same is true today. If Jesus, the master teacher, who was God come in the flesh, couldn't win them all, neither can we. We can't force people to be receptive to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The fact is, that's not our job. The Holy Spirit convicts and convinces men of their sin and calls them to repentance. Our job, our job is to spread the seed of the gospel to every heart we have an opportunity to reach out to. Some will be receptive and others will not. We should never allow the hard-heartedness of others to keep us from spreading the good news of the gospel. The seed, it is good seed. If it never gets out of the planter, if it never gets into the field, it will never produce fruit. But if it does, if we plant that field, if we spread those seeds, if it gets out there to the hearts of men, if we sow the seed of the gospel, there'll be an abundant harvest. 
There's good soil out there. There are open hearts out there. Let's do our utmost to share the good news of salvation with everyone we meet. Let's be effective farmers in the kingdom of Almighty God. Have you been taking the Great Commission seriously? Have you been sharing the gospel with others? If not, now is the time to begin doing exactly that. Would you pray with me as we close today? Dear God, we know that you've commissioned us to go into all the world, preaching the gospel, making disciples, teaching them to obey everything that you have commanded them, baptizing them into you. We know that you've told us these things, dear Lord. Sometimes it's easy for us to sit back and think someone else is going to do it. Help us to begin to take seriously our responsibility to spread the good news of salvation that comes through the blood of Christ given freely on Calvary. Thanks for doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. As we close this service today, help us to make a difference in the world that we live in. For it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen.